seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. Call it for today. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we who trust in your mercy and know your love, rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Collect for Battle of Britain Sunday. Gracious God, we have gathered on this Battle of Britain Sunday to give thanks once more for the liberty which that battle preserved for us and the world and for the world. We remember with gratitude the dedication and heroism of members of the Royal and Allied Air Forces. We remember their successes, our colleagues now engaged in many parts of the world. And we pray that you would watch over them. We pray for our Air Force that its power and skill may be always used to safeguard justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 50, beginning at the 15th verse. Realising that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Here ends the first reading. The epistle is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 14, beginning at the first verse. Welcome to those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarrelling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. <coughs> who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honour of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in the honour of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honour of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? 
for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Here ends the epistle. We have now our gradual hymn number 612. said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sin against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his, order, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, seized him by the throat and said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison, until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgive you all that debt which you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? In anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my Heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Be, o Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit. I suppose I could um, preach a sermon on politically correct veganism, if you look at the epistle, but I am not going to. And nor am I going to preach about slaves and their debts. I'm going to talk about war. In his speech on the 18th of June, 1940, Winston Churchill said to the House of Commons, what General Weygand called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. And I have put that in red as I want to return to Christian civilization. 
Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned upon us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free, and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. Well, I'm not sure it's done that, but there we are. But if we fail, the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protected by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves as if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years. Men will still say this was their finest hour. And indeed, from the 10th of July 1940 to the 31st of October, we had the Battle of Britain, which Churchill described as this great uh, battle, which has been in progress over this island for the last few weeks, has recently attained a high intensity. And he goes on to talk about building hostile airfields. And later, as Cameron Tony said, the gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except for the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British Airmen, who, undaunted, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. What does it mean to us today? Very simply, we are still a free nation. If we had lost the Battle of Britain, if we had even lost Dunkirk, we'd have been in a mess. Hitler needed to control the skies as he needed to control the seas. As long as we could stand up in the sky and on the ocean, we had a chance. And Churchill could see that. And why was Churchill fighting so hard? And I come back again to the survival of Christian civilization. If we look at the war, if we look at the horrors, and let's face it, war is not a pleasant thing. It is horrible. People die. People are maimed in body, mind and spirit. There's nothing glorious about a war. Did we have to fight in 1939? Yes, we did. It's not quite the same as in 1914 which we're talking about the aggrandizement of the Kaiser. Here we are talking about the survival of Christian civilization. Hitler and his terrible people would have subjected the whole world, if they could, to a monstrous tyranny. Could we allow that? You know, there's lots of things that people say about a just war, and is war at any price just? If we have to save Christian civilization, if we have to save the freedom of every man, woman, and child, think about that. As I say, war is horrible. War is nasty. When you think of the blitz, and you think of people dying in their homes. I was at my aunt's funeral on Thursday, and she was bombed out of her house. She came back from hospital, and the house did not exist. And there are so many like that. I don't know whether any of you have ever seen the film Sink the Bismarck. 
brilliant film with Kenneth Moore. He comes home, he's Captain Shepard. He comes home, he finds his house no longer exists. That is war in reality. My wife masterminded an exhibition at the Museum of Liverpool Life, the Maritime Museum, called Spirit of the Blitz. And she went round and interviewed lots of people. And some of the stories were horrible. Can any of you remember Liverpool after the war? I can remember seeing Queen Victoria's monument, uh, Derby Square, and there's nothing round it. Everything had gone. Lord Street was a complete and utter mess. And then one of the terrible things about that war, the Custom House. One of the finest buildings in Liverpool, which could have been rebuilt, the council had it pulled down. It had a direct hit. That is war. That's where it becomes horrible. But did we have to fight it? Yes, we did. We had to fight a monstrous tyranny so that Christian civilization would remain. We could have done no other for every man, woman and child in this nation and the generations that come after us. My daughter is free because these men and women fought for her freedom. At the moment we're not very free. We're having a little bit of a problem. But it's got nothing to do with tyranny. It's got to do with ill health. There's a great difference. Think about that. So my parting words, really, I suppose. Look with gratitude. Think what people have done for us. But in dealings with other people, remember what the Gospel says. And do not do double dealing. Love our brothers, our sisters. Who are they? Well, you are my brothers and sisters. In Christ's name, we all are one. Hitler couldn't understand that. We can. And we are grateful. Amen. Stand now and proclaim our faith in the words of the short creed. Let us declare our faith in God. I believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts today and fills us with his love. I believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with the power of our life. I believe in one God, Father, Son, and Let us pray. In the power of the Spirit, and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. On this Battle of Britain Sunday, we remember with gratitude the courage of all who made the supreme sacrifice for us in time of war. 
We give thanks for the freedoms we enjoy and we pray that the offering of their lives may not have been in vain. We give thanks for the service rendered by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Auxiliary Air Force in peacetime and in conflict to the peoples of this and of other lands, for those who fly and those who support them on the ground, for peace preserved and for peril averted. Lord, by your grace, enable us this day to dedicate ourselves anew to the cause of justice, freedom and peace, and give us the strength and will to build a better world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the renewal of the Church throughout the world, that it may be a living example of a loving community, a beacon for those in search of justice and peace, and a force for reconciliation in today's divided world. We continue to pray for our diocese and for our own parish, for Father David and all the clergy team. And we pray too, at the moment, for all who are charged with caring for and maintaining this building, as they seek to ensure that it can continue to be a place of rest, refuge and refreshment to all who come here. Strengthen all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for the peoples and communities of the world. We pray for all who suffer exploitation, oppression or terrorism, and for those who live amidst warfare, unrest or the threat of violence. We pray especially at this time for the people of Belarus and for the people of Lebanon, in particular in Beirut. And we pray for Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe as she now faces more uncertainty. We pray for the leaders of the nations and for all in positions of power that they may act with wisdom, discernment and integrity. And we pray for our own nation and for all who bear the responsibility of government. Give them wisdom and integrity and plant in them a true desire to work for the well-being of all people and the peace of the world. Bless and guide Elizabeth our Queen, give wisdom to all in authority and direct this nation and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that all may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. In these uncertain times, we pray for all who bear responsibility for the health and safety of our nation. We give thanks for the knowledge and skills of the scientists and healthcare professionals, and we ask that you may give them strength and resilience as they pursue their calling. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our local community here in Chester, for all who live, work or study here, and for all who come as visitors. We pray for our schools and colleges as they open their doors again and return to the business of educating our young people. And we pray that as the young people in each generation discover your world in their own way, that their energies might be used creatively in your service and their choices based on what is true and of real value. We give thanks for our families, friends and neighbours, for all who share with us in our joys 
and comfort us in our sorrows. Strengthen our love for one another. Deepen our understanding of each other's needs and help us to serve Christ in one another and to love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We hold up to you all who are distressed in body, mind or spirit, and we pray for those who care for them. We pray for all who have been hurt or made homeless by the fires in Oregon. On our own parish prayer list, we continue to pray for Mike Shobrook, Canon Tony, Jackie Owen and her husband, Deb Parks, Tim Wheeler, <coughs> Linda Marianne Dutton, Stuart Chisholm, Mo Pollitt, Michi Bartlett, Eleanor Jones, Mavis Bailey, William Pritchard, and Julia Evans. And we pray for the housebound, Mary Lunt, Marjorie Isles, Jean Rowlands, and Audrey Wilson, and all the residents of Calling Court. Lord, we ask you to bless all that is done for their care, enfold them in your healing love, and bring them comfort and relief according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your merciful care all who have died recently, remembering especially Pearl Cartwright, whose funeral is on Thursday. And in the year's mind, we remember Sheila Cross, Joan Harrison, and Nancy Haywood. Hear us as we remember all who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And so rejoicing in the fellowship of St John the Baptist and of all your saints, both living and departed, we commend ourselves and your whole creation to your unfailing love. And we say together, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Now to the peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. COVID-19 pandemic and all the people who are helping. There is an additional and very important Eucharist tomorrow at 10 o'clock for the Feast of the Holy Cross, which is so special to this church. It will be celebrated with due solemnity. Remember that until the Reformation, this church, this cathedral church, was supposed to have a piece of the true cross found by St. Helena in Jerusalem. The only problem is 
that if you add up all the pieces of the true cross in Europe and now in the United States, you get a small wood. Nevertheless, medieval pilgrims believed it. And this church, this cathedral, was very, very special. So we will celebrate the Mass of the Holy Cross tomorrow. A reminder that the following important festivals take place. Monday the 21st of September is St. Matthew's Day, and there will be an additional Eucharist. Sunday the 27th is our Harvest Festival Eucharist. Please be generous with tinned and packaged goods for the food bank and for Chester aid to the homeless. Tuesday the 29th of September is Michaelmas Day. Um, I shall go and nick some of Jill Hopkins' um, Michaelmas daisies. I haven't gotten them myself now. St. Michael and all angels. And there will be a solemn Eucharist at 10 o'clock. And finally, the first um, Sunday in October, the 4th of October, is our dedication festival. A little tinkering to our short service books, and the priest list will be ready for next Sunday. Hymns have been sorted out, and we'll try and do that each week with just a verse. Anybody who wants to know what we've been up to and what we have in mind for the reordering of the church, especially members of the PCC, because we haven't been allowed to have a PCC meeting, should re remain behind after this Eucharist. And Simon um, will explain what we're up to. Uh, it's taken an awful long time to get where we are, but we're getting there and a great debt is owed to Simon for all the hard work that he and Malcolm have done. Um, yesterday we had a wedding here, and uh, sadly, Yana Aulus, the photographer, uh, has lost her camera. If anybody finds a camera, will they let me know? I think that's it. What's our offertory here? I don't know. Three eight. Three eight zero. Three eight zero. Whatever it is. That's the name of Jesus.
Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I have no word to say to you, but only say the word that I shall give you. We join with all the choirs of heaven and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's lift up our hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us with your children, and were under us as if we you. In Christ you assured our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross, and made for all the perfect sacrifice of sin. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks to the Father, he gave it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of his kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Accept through him, our great High Priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your Holy Spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be unto you, O Father, almighty, world without end. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the bread from under your table. But you, Lord, the God of our salvation, and share your bread with sin. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord God, the source of truth and love, keep us faithful to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship. Unite in prayer at the breaking of bread and one in joy and simplicity of heart. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So together in thanksgiving we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out as a cloud of your spirit to live and work your great glory. Amen. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love and care for this day and unto eternity. Amen. Amen. The Eucharist is ended. Go forth from this sacred place in the peace of Christ to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.
right. right. It's been a very long time since we've had a chance to have a catch up on what is going on with the church. And as you can all see now, we've progressed to the stage where the west window has now been completed, apart from putting on the, um, the, the sort of bars that go on the outside to protect it. So those will be done, those should be going in next week, not this week, but next week. So by that time, then the west window will be finished. It's handed back to us. Now, as you can see in the north aisle, the pews have gone now, and they have started to put in some of the hardcore. Um, they shifted six and a half tons one day this week, and we're still a bit short. We're about three tons short at the moment. So the rest of the hardcore will be coming back in tomorrow, and tomorrow, this week we will also be getting this, the um, paving stones that are going to go into the lawn pile. So that work is starting this week. And we're also, um, the lighting will, will arrive tomorrow as well. So we've got more hardcore, more lighting coming in tomorrow. So we're going to start on the, light, the lighting part of the church. Now, so far as the heating is concerned, all you'll see is that one of the radiators has gone AWOL over in the far corner down in the northwest corner. That isn't the only thing they've done. They've come in, they've removed the old boiler. That's completely gone now to the boiler room. And so we're just waiting for them. I haven't got a date yet, but they're coming back fairly soon to start on the heating work because we are going to need it before long. So uh, that is all that is all taking place. There's a meeting with the um, we've got a meeting with the architect in the morning at ten o'clock, have a weekly meeting with him. So we'll go, I'll have some more information on what is going on with the church then. Now has anybody got any questions? Barry. <laughs> right, eventually Eventually, what I will be doing with the North Isle is um, we will be putting together an exhibition, taking stuff out of the chapter house. I don't know how many people have actually been to the chapter house and seen all the artefacts we've got there. Huge numbers of them. We've got artefacts in the chapter house. We've also got some artefacts in the vestry, which comprise certain things such as sailing wear, um, tiles that were found, we think, when John Douglas built the new tower in the, uh, in the northeast corner here, back in the 1880s. But we don't know for sure, but they belong to the church, and it's a good idea to get all that on display. And what I'm going to do